4, verse 16, through chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, to, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let's take a moment of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning and we should stand in awe of who you are, stand in awe of what you have done in our lives. Lord, it seems such a privilege to be able to read your word, to hear what it says to our hearts, and to live our lives in a way that give you glory. In the name of your Son, amen. So today's passage starts with the word therefore. And one thing that's been beaten into me over the years is when you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what is it therefore? So if you back up to the beginning of chapter 4, you find out it also begins with therefore. You really need to go back to the last half of chapter 2 and, for, and most of chapter 3 to find out that Paul is talking about how great this new covenant is, the covenant that we have from Jesus. And then because of that covenant, he spends a few verses in, in opening chapter 4 telling us about where that treasure is stored, and he calls us jars of clay. So... The context of this is the greatness of the message stored in the weakness of these lives. I guess I'm done. <laughs> but you know what? We have to live these lives. And all too often, especially this time of the year, a lot of people spend an awful lot of time looking back in their life what happened last year or maybe what happened years before, and they groan and moan about the troubles and the pains and the aches, especially as we get older. Um, and, and we forget that that's only part of who we are. We forget that. You know, I have to tell you, age has always been one of those things that kind of puzzles me. I, I still remember... I grew up in, in a time, and some of you did as well, and I don't know, maybe even today, where if you're in your teenage years, you know, anybody over 30 wasn't trustworthy because they were over the hill. <laughs> you know, that's the way we looked at people. It was, you hit 30, you were done. And, and that sounds funny, but did you know that scientifically 30 is about where your body peaks? And after that, you really are going downhill? Ooh. So, so there's a little bit of, of, even in the jest, that whole being over 30 is a monumental step. You know, and, and we don't often take the time to think about it that way, but I still remember, I'll never forget my 40th birthday. And I'll never forget it because one of my friends said to me, 
How does it feel to be middle-aged? And I'm thinking, you know, at that time, I only knew a handful of 80-year-olds, and most of them, to be honest, had one foot in the grave. It didn't feel so good. <laughs> you know? I, it really didn't feel so good. It felt like I had finally hit a wall, and there was nothing I was going to do to stop this body from running headlong into its eternal state. Did you know that we actually have two different ages? So we have our physical age, the one we're born with, and that's measured by the turn of a clock and the number of years that pass. And for some of us, that's quite a few decades. For others, it's still a long way in front of you before you ever see any of what some of us have seen. And yet, we tend to focus on that. But there's another thing called your biological or fitness age that comes into play. You know, I remember going to the doctor, um, and it was I went to a cardiologist, and he ran all these tests, and he comes into me and says, "You have the heart of a 48-year-old." Now, if you're 30, that's not good news. Okay, but I was 67 at the time, and it felt great to hear that. I've since been told that the likelihood, and it doesn't mean this can happen, but the likelihood of me having a heart attack is very, very slim. Now, there's lots of other things in life that can go wrong, so I'm not going to focus on that. But we have two ages, and one of them tends to make us look backwards, but the other one can help us look forward. Now, you might be asking yourself, what in the world does this have to do with the passage we just read? Well, I think that this passage tells us how to look differently at the world by looking at Jesus, and instead of always looking back at loss, looking back and collecting what God has done to look forward and see what he can do in our lives. And that, to me, is the most important thing, regardless of the state of this body. God has done things in our lives. Some of them are pleasant memories. Some of them are horrendous memories. And even in some of those horrendous memories, there are many people that I know that have been through very, very difficult things, say they did not enjoy one minute of it, but they wouldn't trade it for the world because of what God showed them while it was happening. And so when we look back, we can choose to focus and stay there. We can choose to wallow in the sorrow or the pain or the suffering or the trials that we went through. Or, as Paul reminds us, we can remember God created everything God is in control of everything, and we can say, what did God teach me, and where am I going? And that is very, very much what I think Paul is trying to say here. Earlier in the verses we didn't read, as I said, he calls us jars of clay. So, you know, if anybody's had clay jars or clay vases in their house and bumped them and they hit the floor, you know just how fragile they are the chances of them making it to a floor from a table and surviving are very thin. They're very fragile. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, we have a treasure that is immeasurable inside of us, inside those jars of clay. How fantastic it is. And he tells us why that's true. He says that's true because if we weren't jars of clay, we would tend to claim that fantastic treasure as our own, and we would be boasting about what we can do and what we have instead of what that treasure is and who it really belongs to. And it does not belong to me or you. It belongs solely to God, and it is ours solely to enjoy him, to give him glory, and to share that message with others. So, so Paul is really just trying to explain to us how fragile we are, how that 
time passing is not going to stop until we reach eternity. You know, um, I love it. One, one commentator wrote, wrote it about this. The message of salvation and the results that it produces are glorious and divine. Now think about this for a moment. God takes something that is glorious and divine and puts it inside something that is fragile and breakable. You have to wonder about how awesome our God is because he can preserve his glory and his divine message even in the middle of our frailty. And that is the God that we serve. <clears throat> I think all too often, though, we get wrapped up in the jar. In the, in the metaphor, in the part that we read, Paul calls us tents, and I think that's another apt thing. I know there's a number of you that have been camping on multiple occasions, and some of you have actually gone tent camping, and perhaps some of you have gone tent camping when the weather turned foul and the winds picked up. Tents are wonderful, and they do a great job, but if they're not set up properly, or if they're not waterproofed properly, or if you just happen to pitch them in a spot that's a little too low and the weather rolls in, you're going to get wet and probably cold. But the message inside is us, and we can carry our message outside those tents. And Paul focuses on the frailty of us simply to tell us about the glorious message inside of us the glorious message that Jesus is part of our lives. You know, it almost sounds like when, when Paul wrote these verses, he, he wrote, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, not in despair, or persecuted, not abandoned, or struck down, not, not destroyed. We always carry around the body of death of Jesus so that life of Jesus is revealed in our body. Jesus is part of who we are. He promised that he sits on the throne of our heart. And so when we focus on the decay, we're missing something because Jesus' body didn't decay. He rose up out of the grave. You know, it, it's... I, my, uh, my, my, my wife tells me I have to stop using mountain bikes uh, as examples, but you guys are stuck with them. <laughs> I love to track my rides, and I track tons and tons of data. You have to understand that my career that I retired from, I was a data analyst, so there's no getting away from the part of me that loves to look at data and see how it all fits together. And so I track heart rate, uh, distance, the power I put out, you name it, it's probably, I probably have a tracker for it. And, and I get done and I analyze my rides. Well, a number of years ago, I realized that no matter how good I am, it's not likely that I'm going to beat the previous year's records. <laughs> and I spent a little bit of time thinking about that. And you know what? It's okay. I don't have to beat the previous year's records. I'm not tracking the data to see the decline. I'm tracking it to plan what I can do. And there are some, some wonderful trips I have taken just because I know how much endurance I have, how much fluid I have to take in during those trips and those kinds of things so that I can plan for them and not get out in the middle of nowhere and suddenly find myself with a loss for energy and no way to get back. So I'm looking forward I look back, I measure what I've done, and I use that to look forward. And that's kind of what Paul's telling us is, look back. Don't be afraid to look back. But don't wallow there. Don't, don't worry about what you've lost. Look at what you can do, and look at what you can gain. Um, and by the way, this year I beat records that I set three years ago. So <laughs> wasn't planning on that, but it, it, it was true. Um, you know, we, especially if we have a health problem. If we have a health problem, we get all wrapped up in how, how we're feeling and, gee, is this ever going to go away, especially if it's something chronic or, or long-term. And we can get so focused on 
how bad I feel or how I can't do this or I can't do that, that we forget that there are things we can do. And as we look through this, I would say it's good to reflect on that, but look at what God brought you through. Look at where he, where he put you. Look at how you can now use that to talk to somebody else that's struggling with something similar. How you can look at that and say, God is good because I am here and I know who he is. So, groaning, looking back, looking forward, groaning, or living with joy? Hmm. So, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we know that even if we die, we live. We are promised eternal life. You know, and in, uh, in the earlier verses that we didn't read, Paul goes, he, he talks about um, that, he reminds us that God is doing all this and that it was all done through Jesus. And he talks about Jesus, the gospel message, the new covenant, being the greatest thing. And Jesus died for us. We sang it in our song. Jesus atoned for us. We in and of ourselves, could never do that. And yet Jesus, God himself, comes down from heaven, becomes man, lives a life in a way that we could never live it, and says, for all of you, I will sacrifice my life on a cross so that you can live with me forever. That's the message. That's that wonderful new covenant that is written on our hearts, written inside the tent, and written in the jars of clay. You know, there's a reason that Paul can say that, because he says we have a body that was built by God. I, I if you know me well, you know I love Genesis, especially the first few chapters, because I think that everything that we see and do today can be explained there. You know, but God created us in his image. We were meant to live eternally. And it is only because of the fall that we can't do that, that our bodies decay, that we have the problems that we've been talking about. But here again, God says, when he created things, he said, let there be light. And Paul, when he opens this, these verses, reminds us that the light of God is in us. When I think about that, and I think about the darkness of the world, I wonder how many of us, myself included, just want to hide that light and keep it for ourselves. But that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to bring that light into the darkness so that the darkness can be pushed away by God and God uses us, as frail as we are, to do that. So if we know that, why do we still focus on the things that are going wrong? I mean, I would go back and say, I'd argue that it's because of our fallen nature, but that seems almost too simple. To be, tr be truthful, I think that many of us like to focus there because we can use it as an excuse to not do something. If I don't feel well, then I don't have to do this. If, I, if I'm physically limited, then obviously I can't do that. So it gives us an out, but God doesn't give us an out. God said that message is inside of us, and it is not meant for us. It is not our message. We need to share it. And so as Paul is talking to us, you know, he, he says... Um, he says to us that it's okay to groan. You know, there's, there's a time for mourning, there's a time for groaning, but that's not where we stay. We need to move on and focus with what God's got in store for us and coming. My wife and I are radically different when trials happen, and we've shared this in Sunday school classes together, and, and so I, you know, I'm weird. Just ask her, I'm weird. When trials come along, most people are like, oh, no, here we go again. I'm like, 
oh no, here we go again. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a glib way. But I have learned that in every single trial that comes into my life, the first thing I need to do is look at God and say, what am I trying to learn here? Or what are you doing with me? Because if I do that at the end, I don't experience it the same way. And that's just me, but that's the way I like to look at life is God has us in these situations for a reason. And God will say to us, here's what you, here's what you need to do. But we need to look for it. I don't, I don't know about you, but it, I, I, I wouldn't really ever claim that, you know, the heavens open up and God speaks to me like he spoke to Moses. There are times when I wish he would, but there's also times when I'm glad that he doesn't. You know, um, so I need to jump back 20 years for this. And some of you were here and some of you weren't. But 20 years ago, I was in an accident that nearly took my life. And I'm just going to do this real quick so that I can get to my point. I nearly took my life. I survived the accident, went home, started feeling really, really weird. My body was like starting to tingle all over. I got rushed back to the hospital, had another life-threatening incident, and then came home. All through that, I made up my mind that everyone that walked past me was going to hear the gospel, and I was faithful to that. I get home... And I'm recovering fairly well, not as fast as I would like, but fairly well. And I decided to go out back and shoot my bow because I love archery. Well, this arm doesn't have an elbow anymore. It has a hinge. And I picked up my bow, and I went like this. And I picked up my bow, and I went like this. And I sat down and bawled like a baby. And I couldn't get past that. I couldn't get past it so bad that it wasn't until my wonderful wife said to me, you need help, and we sought help. And, you know, I realized I was staying back there. I could still walk. I could still play my guitar. I could still make music. I could still go out and enjoy nature. And if you know me, I can still get on a bike and ride really hard. It took a little bit of practice, but I can do it. I still cannot pull a bow. Um, but that's okay. I cannot stay there. God says, look at what you can do and look at what you can use. Look at who you can talk to. And I have talked to people who have lost things and can't do something. And I can explain to them, I kind of understand. I don't know exactly how you feel, but let me share this with you. And it gives me an opportunity to talk about the glory of God and what he can do in our lives. So I don't focus back there. Doesn't mean I don't go back there, but I don't focus back there. And we shouldn't focus back there. Like I said, Paul switches metaphors and calls us a tent. It's just another word for being frail. So the question is, we're frail. We have this wonderful, wonderful message. So what do we have to be confident about? Because Paul tells us that we have confidence. And he says what we have confidence in is what God has promised us. And God has promised us everlasting life. God has said, believe in my son Jesus and what he has done for you. And you will, not might, not maybe, you will have eternal life. So it's New Year's Eve, and tomorrow starts a new year. And tonight, many, many people would be sitting down, looking back over the year, talking about the things they should have done or didn't do, and they will make resolutions about what they're going to do in the coming year. And I've heard from people who have studied this that by the end of January, almost every one of those resolutions is done. So we have a resolution that we can be confident in, not because we made it, but because God made it. God made the resolution that we believe in Jesus and we have eternal life, and that is our confidence. So this should impact how we live. This should help us look forward. 
<clears throat> number of months ago, well, actually in November, at the men's breakfast, um, our speaker, uh, Mike Rallo, he use, use, uses movie clips, and he brought up a clip from Hook. And if you don't know the story, it's Peter Pan, grown up, forgot he's Peter Pan, and he's really this rough, tough businessman. Everything's around business, business, business. Hook steals his children, and Pan has to go back. And Mike used this one scene where Peter Pan finally realizes that he is the, his name is Peter Browning at that point. He realizes that he is the Pan, that he is not lost, that he has an outlook that can look forward and that he can do things beyond even his own expectations because of that attitude. Now, I would suggest that we can do things beyond our own expectations, not because we're youthful in our brain, but because God is in our heart and God uses us to do things. God uses ex in ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And sometimes those things may not seem extraordinary to you, but to someone else, they may mean the difference between life and death eternally. God can use you to change somebody's heart. So all that data tracking I do is not about what has been, but about what can be. And I would say in a very real sense, our spiritual lives are like that. We should be looking at what God has done so that we can look at what he can do. Many places in the scriptures, God says, look back, you know, cross, cross the River Jordan, put stones out here from the river so that when you look at these, you can remember what I did. Even Jesus says on the night of his betrayal, when you do this, remember me. When he's talking about the Lord's Supper, when, when we enjoy the Lord's Supper together. So, you know, I talked about our chronological and biological ages in the beginning. And I think in some senses they represent our spiritual lives as well. There are people who have been Christians for a very, very long time and it's measured by a clock. Oh, they're faithful to church, they read, but, but they just move along. There are other people who seem to be just bouncing all over and everything they do and talk about is God and, and you know, they, they seem more youthful. But the one thing I have learned by tracking that data is I'm not stuck where it is. I can do better. Now, there are certain physical limits and you know, roughly the best you can do is take about 12 years off of your chronological age. So, but we can practice at this, and the same is true. We can read scripture, look at what God has done in our lives, look at what he can do, and then be bold enough to go and do it. So my challenge for all of us is that as we enter this new year, I challenge us each to spend the first few days or the week looking back and looking forward. Look at what God has done. Look at what he can do. And out of all of that, take one item, prayer, journaling, um, reading your Bible, whatever, whatever God lays on your heart, take one of those items and be faithful for, with it. Make that your resolution, to draw closer to Jesus through things that he has called us to do. Keep in mind that this action is a reflection of Jesus in our lives. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before the crucifixion, we even see Jesus looking back and reflecting and then looks forward to where God is taking him. And in doing that reflection, the writer of Hebrews tells us, <clears throat> hard for us to imagine, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The cross was not something that was easy to endure. It was painful. It was hard. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion, but many historians will tell you that they perfected it. They knew exactly 
how to torment a human body. It was not a good experience. And yet, for the joy, that joy is you and me and every other believer that will live with God forever because of this piece of work that Jesus did for us. So our attitude should be that whether we're going through a trial or going through a time of ease, we need to reflect on what Jesus has done in our life and look forward to what God will do next. Let us pray. Father, in our lives, it is often for us to, easy to get caught up in the daily grind or the things that we want to do and to just set aside the time that we should spend with you. Lord, help us to keep our hearts focused on you. Help us to be pure. Help us to be holy because that's what you have called us. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. <laughs>